What's up, dude? How are you? Yeah, doing well yourself. Doing very well. How's things going? Yeah, not too bad. Can't complain. How about yourself? Good. I'm dealing with a fractured ankle at the moment. Yeah, what'd you do? Uh, so I got a dog, and literally yep. this, the second day, I jumped up in the air like maybe three inches off the ground to catch a ball, and I yep. fell, and I heard a pop, and next thing you know, it's fractured in two places. Jesus. Well, I'll put the damper on things. Yeah, so that sucks. So I'm. It doesn't hurt. Um, I can walk on it in a boot. I don't need surgery or anything, thankfully. I just got to be in the boot for two more weeks, and they said move to a brace, so that's what I'm dealing what'd you, with. What did you break? Uh, shit. It is literally like, I don't know the exact name. It's the ball, like on the inside and outside of the ankle. I've, oh, you broke medial and lateral malleolus? Yeah, the malleolus, that's what it is. Oh, good on you, man. Yeah, so that sucks. <laughs> are, you, um, are you trying to prep for... Um... Bodybuilding or powerlifting now? Uh, bodybuilding. I'm done with powerlifting. Yeah, fuck powerlifting. Yeah. <laughs> My heart's in bodybuilding anyway, so. Yeah. It's well, just, man. Just fun to lift heavy stuff. Yeah, you made a good run of it there. Battle of the Bay. Yeah, thank you. All right, man. So, um, what's, um, what's format here? How do you want to run this? Uh, kind of just like more so just general general conversation. Um, I really want to kind of go over the importance of accessory lifts and identifying weaknesses on the big three and how yeah. to kind of program around that besides just doing the big three. Yeah, for sure. Okay. So um, yeah. I'll just kind of do like a short introduction. Hey, what's up guys? Blah, blah, blah. Here with yeah. Jordan Chalo and then kind of give you an introduction of yourself and we'll kind of jump into it. That's cool. Sounds good, man. Yeah, fire away. All right, cool. What's up, everybody? Josh Vogel here with Dr. Jordan Shallow. He is my special guest today. He is a chiropractor and competitive power lifter, and I believe he's also a strength and conditioning coach, correct? Yeah, that's right. Okay, awesome, man. So why don't you go ahead and give us a little bit of your – just a quick brief brief background of how you kind of got into all of that, and then we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, yeah, so as you mentioned um... – chiropractor by trade so moved out here to california from canada about six years ago uh completed grad school out here um as i was finishing up i sort of got linked up with um dan green um and boss barbell club so those of you in the powerlifting community i'm sure know dan um so when i graduated i um i was working at apple at the time and um kind of made the transition over from corporate wellness into private practice inside of boss barbell and and from there, he got me started kind of in powerlifting, just kind of by osmosis, like getting to work with him and and some of the other big lifters that boss um, kind of made for a simple transition, like always, always lifted, always squatted, always benched, always deadlifted for sport, um, but never thought I would deadlift, bench and squat as a sport. Okay. Um, but once I started working with these guys, I was like, okay, yeah, I could, I could do this um, with all my focus being on being on school. Um, I kind of got away from being competitive. So as I graduated, I was like, yeah, let's, let's give it a shot. And that was, um, it was about a year, almost two years now. I've been competing in powerlifting for about two years. Okay. Um, what are, so, what are some of your best lifts? Uh, sure. So, uh, best lifts right now, squat is, so 330 kilo squat, which is 727. Uh, 200 kilo bench, 441, and then deadlift is 755 or 342, five kilos. So and those those um, are raw numbers. Yeah, okay. yeah. Um, so for me, the my best total on the platform is 1901. Uh, that was record breakers. Um, two, uh, it was two meets ago. It was in November of last year. Okay. Um, and then since being in private practice, I've taken on the role as a uh, strength and conditioning coach for the Stanford rugby team. Um, so we just finished up, or I just finished up my first season with them. So it's kind of uh, back and forth right now. I practice at a boss barbell in Mountain View. I practice out of uh, Combat Sports Academy, CSA, in uh, Dublin. And then I'm at Stanford and then run an online online coaching business as well as a podcast. So it keeps okay. me nice and busy. Yeah, so you're very busy then. Yeah, yeah, it's fun, man. Okay, how do how do you like uh, how do you like or how did rugby or how did the rugby team do this year at Stanford? Uh, yeah, girls did really well. Um, they're gonna kind of make a run. The playoff system is almost like a round robin, so we just wrapped up regular season. Um, I think they only dropped two games this year, so if I'm not mistaken, they were eight and two. Wow. Um, female rugby team at Stanford's very very talented. Um, 
it's a little tougher. Anyone who knows rugby knows that Cal is, is a dominant force in the rugby world. So it's tough being that proximity to Cal um, as far as the men's team go. But, um, yeah, the females did really well. That's awesome, man. So, yeah, it's, it's a fun experience. It's totally not what people think. I get a lot of messages from people like wanting to get into strength and conditioning. And one of the best quotes, I'm actually going to steal this from Jesse Burdick. Um, it's basically collegiate level strength and conditioning and professional level strength and conditioning is like you just don't want your lifters to trip over the weights in the weight room. It's very injury prevention. It's not the... It's not the hoorah kind of thing that people think it is, but mm-hmm. uh, it's fun to apply the clinical approach preemptively to injury prevention, kind of in the weight room with, with I don't want to say real athletes, but um, as I'm a power lifter, I definitely see the difference between power lifting as a sport and then kind of conventional mm-hmm. uh, athletics as a sport. Okay. Yeah. So diving into kind of like our main topic, I, I really want to go over accessory work and its purpose in powerlifting. You, yeah. you see, like, with the rise of Instagram and the rise of, I, I call it, like, the social media power after people who just start squat benching and deadlifting and then two months later do a meet and think they're a coach. Um, yeah. they, they have this mindset, and it seems to be that the only thing that matters is literally your squat bench and deadlift, and they do each lift three times a week um, doing some sort of DUP style. That's, like, what they all seem to preach. And yeah. they believe in very little accessory, and if they do so, it's probably just blood froze blood flow restricted training. Yeah. Um, I, I think this is complete nonsense. I, I, I'm, I'm sure you probably believe the same way, you know, with the boss barbell method and things like that. Um, kind of what's your take on accessory work and how important is it in increasing the squat bench and deadlift? Sure. I mean, I think in the inception of a lifting career, you, you're right. You're basically look at your bottleneck, right? So, your bottleneck for appreciating strength when you start lifting is going to be technique adaptation, right? So the more you can, your basic, your technique is going to fail long before your nervous system gives out or long before your uh, musculoskeletal system gives out. So the failure you're going to approach in the initial stages of lifting is going to be technical failure, which doesn't allow you to reach the metabolic demands of the neurological demands of taxing other energy systems. It's more like your coordination gives out because you don't know what the hell you're doing. So, in the initial stages, higher frequency of compound movements is it's fine, and it'll go it'll go more or less um, uh, uninterrupted because you can't load as heavy as you soon will be able to once that te- technique has adapted to a point where your squat is going to get as from a technical standpoint as good as it's going to be. Um, so in the initial phases, I don't hate that idea because you can't load them too heavy. But over time, if you're just if you're just going to constantly hammer the same pattern, basically I look at it this way. Like imagine, like let's take the squat for example. The squat, let's put it in brackets as an equation where it's like, okay, the squat is comprised of, um, I don't know, 35% quads, 30% hamstrings. That leaves us at 55%. Uh, it's 25% back or core strength, and then the rest is just miscellaneous. So we have this equation of our strength in our squat. Now a lot of people, they just worry about, okay, well – uh, if my quads are weak, um, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna squat and I'm gonna emphasize the quads and all this. So they work just within this equation, where accessory work actually deals with this multiplier outside of an equation. So imagine you come off a meet, like you do your first meet or whatever, and you think like, okay, my my deadlift is weak. I'm gonna work on my deadlift. You're just working within this equation, but the outside of the equation is allows us to express that strength so think of having a multiplier outside an equation if this is anything but one everything to this equation falls subject to a detriment right so yeah first meet you might be able to get away with it second meet you might be able to get away with it but if you're not addressing and equating for where powerlifting goes wrong because powerlifting isn't a balanced sport it's not a functional sport it's very unbalanced and you're predetermining yourself to creating these um these deficiencies and instabilities based off that kind of programming. Like everyone's like, Oh, squatting is functional. It's like, no, it very well is not functional. Squatting is economical. If we want to think of like how our hips function, go back 3.2 billion years ago to the center of Ethiopia, where we split ways with the chimpanzee biped ambulation, our hips meant to function in a gait cycle. Squatting is not functional. So if you don't, if your range of motion of your hips only becomes that what's necessary for the range of motion of the squat, 
you are in such a small box. You have such a little room for air that the second one rep goes bad, you're done. Or the RPE gets too high or however the hell you want to call it. You could like thrash your hips with one rep where if you scale back and you did accessory works within the true function of the hips, like, um, I mean, I really like any permutation of the gait cycle, uh, walking lunges, Bulgarian split squats, single leg RDLs, things that are going to get us uh, prompt that lateral stability that's required through the gait cycle and actually training function of the hips. That'll allow us to screen for potential pathology under heavy load. Like if I wanted to shoot my laptop right now, even a visually impaired person could still hit the laptop. But if I put this laptop, I don't know, over the hill in Santa Cruz, it'd be very apparent to me where on that trajectory, how how off I am on that target, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I see the arsenal that you're shooting with, so I know exactly what, I know you know what I'm talking about. So, But that's like squatting, where right? shooting this computer is like how hips are, how, the demand in which hips need to function in a squat. But if we're only looking here, okay, if I say just hit the screen, okay, fine. But if we start to deviate away and at one point we're off the screen, it's like, it's a binary moment where all of a sudden your hip didn't hurt, your hip didn't hurt, your hip didn't hurt. Fuck, my hip hurts. Put this over the hill, put this you know, 20 miles away by the ocean, and all of a sudden it'll be very apparent where that instability lies, where that inaccuracy lies within your, within your function. So I like using movements like the lunge, basically testing fringe ranges of motion that are unstable because if you're stable in the end range of a walking lunge, the likelihood that you'll be functionally stable within your squat and that instability won't cause you pain that's been equated for. So that likelihood of injury is going to go down. It's the same thing with um, overhead press and benching. A lot of people, depending on your technique, they don't value the overhead press as a movement that directly correlates to the strength in their bench. It's like, oh, it's not that delt dominant or based off where I grip, I don't need overhead strength. It's like, that's fine. That would be addressing a direct correlation of strength gain from the overhead press to the bench. But pressing overhead is way more unstable than pressing over your chest. So this gives me 90 degrees worth of information, right? If I start having shoulder pain overhead and then I just leave it alone and now I start having shoulder pain on an incline press, then I start having shoulder press or shoulder pain on a bench press, it's like I could have checked myself at each one of these stops along the way before I'm left with a lot bigger problem to unpack. So if we can kind of keep the injuries at bay by constantly testing the fringes, and then again, this is once the skill adaptation has been made to the point where I can go off a barbell for, I don't know, three, four months, six months. I can, within a session, I can get my motor pattern back. Right. I can get my squat back to where it was. The skill adaptation is just as progressed as it was six months prior. But I built, I built strength and stability in other muscle groups where it's almost like an insurance policy. Like in case shit goes wrong and this technique breaks down, because that top weight's you know, I've grinded out some squats, you've grinded out some squats, where it doesn't look pretty, but at the end of the day, with powerlifting, it's do you get the white lights, right. and can you continue to go back and train after the meet? Um, so that's kind of at least my theoretical approach to the importance of accessory work, okay. is it's more it's more of a long game, because if you're only focusing on the, the, the narrow demand of range of motion at each joint that's required for each of the competition lifts, you're you're putting blinders on, and, and, and the the walls are slowly closing in and you don't realize it until it's in your narrow field of view. Um, and I think those people, I mean, I run an online business that basically manages injury prevention and prescribing accessory movements. And I can't tell you one of the big things we do is we integrate it with the demand of the workout. How many of those DUP competition style lift three, three times a week? Like I'm going to comp bench this day with, with sumo pulls and, and, and tempo deadlifts I see, or tempo squats I see, it's like, I would say 60% of my clientele operates on that. Now, I, granted, that's not all the lifters in the world, but over a while, that trend starts to manifest itself. Okay, maybe there's something here. Like maybe there's some reason why these people are getting hurt mm -hmm. sticking with the competition lifts. Right, and you know, kind of, I've heard you say it in another, inter or another interview before, but you don't care about how much you're deadlifting until you're on the platform deadlifting. Yeah. And yeah. that, that, that's such an important thing because a lot of people care about, well, shit, I'm six months out from a competition. My deadlift's not where it used to be. Okay, so who, who cares? If you're having issues with the lift, why are you continuing to do the lift with the yeah. issues still there? You, and like you said, you need to address where the issues lie in order to actually better the entire lift. Well, I mean, I compare it to bodybuilding. Like, you know, you're six weeks out from a show. 
you look in the mirror, like, you know, you might be holding a bit of water, you might be, who cares? you know, who cares, right? Yeah. Like, you know what to do, you know how to dial it in, you know how to manipulate your diet. But I, I, think, I think you hit the nail on the head earlier when you were talking about, like, social media and Instagram lifters. It's like, I think that's where a lot of it comes. It's like, it's it's trying to it's trying to one up the Joneses and it's like you can't keep up man like you just got to run your own race like yeah I mean I've, I've stepped on the platform with Larry and Kevin and um and Andrew and it's like what am I gonna do man like I just got to do my own thing like I, if I start watching these guys and start going for like you know I'm just gonna try and narrow the margin between me and Larry Williams at a competition it's like I'll be screwed I'd be in the hospital 10 times over so it's like I think that's a lot of it too is like you got to you got to realize, like, you know, I, I hate the campy Instagram, it's you versus you kind of thing, but it's like, it's just beat your fucking total, man. Like, and that's all it comes down to. I think people try and climb too high too fast because um, they think that there's something waiting for them at the top. It's like, there's not. It's powerlifting. Relax. Yeah. You're, not, you're not making a million dollars from a meet. No, no. God, no. Um, what, what else I want to go over is kind of. I mean, if you look at all the guys, I mean, look at anybody who's posted a video to trains at Boss Fargo, guy or girl, y'all are all jacked. You all do bodybuilding style workouts after your powerlifting moves. And this is another thing I feel that people really leave out is when it comes to getting stronger, you actually do need muscle along with it. You know, training the lift trains the skill. It trains the lift. But you can also get a bigger bench by simply getting a bigger back or even a bigger chest. And doing that hypertrophy style work, I do feel a lot of people leave that out as well. Um, as someone who trains with people who are jacked, I mean, you're jacked yourself, but like Dan. Dan could literally probably do a bodybuilding show if he wanted to. What, what are your thoughts on just the whole bodybuilding incorporating into powerlifting? Yeah, I mean, I was able to, like, I never trained like a powerlifter ever. I always, my first love was bodybuilding through and through. I mean, I had, I, growing up, I had a subscription to Flex and MD. And every month, that's all I would read. So any like I walked into my first meet, uh, yeah, a year and a half ago. After just kind of like doing a powerlifting training cycle, like eight weeks, and then like a peak and all that. And I mean, I won best lifter at 242 with a 1721 total, a six, a 621 squat, a 420 bench, and a 666 deadlift. And there were guys there like that had been doing this for a long time, but that was the one difference. It's like they didn't. I accrued. The majority of my strength through just a lot, a lot, a lot of sub-maximal resistance work to build size. Like I was, I don't, I don't want to toot my own horn. It was just a local meet, but I was muscularity-wise or physique-wise, I looked out of place. And but now it's you realize that okay, you can maybe go to a powerlifting meet and take the top ten best lifters, and you might have one or two guys that look big. From there, you won't really be able to. Uh, draw any major conclusions but if you take the best 10 lifters in the world all of them look like freaks like yeah. I, I go to I go to meets and I just feel like I feel like a little Michelin man like I just feel fat like I, I feel like I've never worked out in my life with some of the guys I compete against just from a physique standpoint not alone let alone a strength standpoint like the correlation obviously isn't one to one otherwise Phil Heath would be showing up at my meets and kicking my ass right but I think a lot of a lot of the I mean, there is a relationship between building cross-sectional area of muscle and the strength of that muscle. Um, but two, because I think the the submaximal resistance it, that helps build resiliency through kind of more inert, soft tissue structures in the body. That's your tendons. That's your ligaments. Things that that only really adapt after a period of time under tension. Where it's like if you're hitting these like, oh, bro, like PR triple, fucking RPE seven, like. You hit three reps, dude. Like the, your your nervous system may be able to adapt a little bit to that stimulus if the intent uh, is creating force by acceleration rather than mass. But like you're not doing anything to any other system in your body, right? So it's like nervous system adaptation happens first. Like look at the chronological order of like training. Like you walk into the gym for the first time, guess what? You're PR city for the first like three months, right? Your nervous system is going to, you know, the motor unit recruitment pattern is going to uptake and uptake until you've reached a capacity. Then it's like, okay, what happens next? Well, once we go nervous system, then it's muscle. Then the muscle sort of takes over. Then you can start to build muscle from there. But then if we think about further along that spectrum of adaptation, it's like, okay, so we have nervous system first, kind of stability, then build motor unit recruitment. Then it goes muscle. 
But then after muscle, then it comes tendinous adaptations. You do something wrong enough for long enough, tendinosis, tendinitis. That's because you don't have the stability. You don't have the strength. You don't have the muscle. Stress goes here. This is where the adaptation is happening. Past that again, past tendons and ligaments, we go into bone, right? Like if you don't have the stability, you don't have the strength, you don't have the muscle, your tendons can't take it anymore. Now bone, like people that have like a femoral acetabular impingement, that's literally their hip being so unstable under so much load that it starts to grow a bone. It says, stop fucking moving, right? So people don't realize the, the benefit of hypertrophy as far as like creating a buffer of tissue that will allow you to bridge that gap between loading a lot of strength and not allowing that, that load to go into more inert structures like your tendons, like your ligaments, and like your bones. Okay. Um, with, with that, you know, how how do you uh, – I'm trying to figure out how to say this. Yeah, yeah, yeah no worries. So when, when you start to put a load – and say your body starts to say like, hey, like I, I, I can't lift this anymore. And yeah. you know, injury is going to happen if people continue. Yeah. What's the best way to start to fix this before it is too late, before your bones start to grow and it's like, oh fuck, like you shouldn't be moving. I mean, obviously it depends on how far people start to push it. But yeah. when it comes to reversing what has been done, say, oh, tendonitis is the biggest thing. Uh, you always, I, I get freaking 20 messages a day about tendonitis. And People are like, what's the best thing to do? Yeah. What would you say is the best thing to do for people who are doing this? I mean, yeah, no, easy. Because to me, it's like I, I get equal frequency of messages, like 20 messages a day elbow tendonitis with squatting or benching, or patella tendonitis with squatting or deadlifting. And it's like, or people, the ironic thing to me is people will always reference it by kind of its common nomenclature. I have golfer's elbow or I have tennis elbow. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, when's the last time you golfed? You're 275, you asshole. Like, when's the last time you picked up a club? What's your longest drive? And obviously, they can't put their elbows together, so they're not going to be grabbing a club. So the, the misnomer with itis, osis, and opathies is that people are sold on the idea that they're overuse injuries. It's like, that's bullshit. That's bullshit. I, I have bicep tendonitis. Really? When was the last time you did a bicep curl? Oh, I'm a powerlifter. You never have. It's like, it's not overuse. It's misuse, mm -hmm. right? So I think a lot of what I would start then is like, okay, if we believe in this spectrum or this chronological order of adaptation, and we think we've reached the point where we've, where we've created tendinous adaptations that are aberrant, that are uh, misplaced or unfounded, I would go right back to stability. Stability is the first one I mentioned from a neurological, like if you took someone in off the street, and I'll do this in my office frequently, when people have like a knee or hip pain, I'll just get them to stand on one leg. And I'll explain to someone like, I have some people who literally don't have the proprioception and don't have the lateral stability through their glutes to stand on one leg without tipping over or teetering. But now imagine like a single leg RDL is the stability equivalent of like a 400 pound bench. Now, if you walked in my office and you said, I want to bench 400 pounds, but I can't bench an empty bar. It's like, all right, well, give me like three years. Mm -hmm. Give me three years of like smart programming, deload back on the program, like, let, let me work with you for like three years and we might be able to get there. But if you think that a single leg RDL is maybe the equivalent of a 400 pound bench, give me five minutes with someone who can't stand on one leg and I can get them to do a single leg RDL. That's how fast the stability stimulus is adapted to in the body. Because guess what? Again, there are function, putting one foot in front of the other. There is a, a evolutionary biology benefit to being able to stay stable through your hips because you're loading that instability through your hips every single time you heel strike, every single time you take a step throughout the day. So it's not just in the gym. So for me, elbow tendonitis, um, knee tendonitis, uh, bursitis, all these places, I start with unilateral stability tests. I'm like, okay, first off, are you, do you have the mobility to get into unstable positions? Because that's a big thing with stability. It's like if your external rotation is here, it's like, well, we can't really get that joint into an unstable position. This is still rather structurally stable. So we need to free up that mobility so we can get into that externally rotated position because stability is all about proprioception. It's about relative joint positions so our nervous system then can fire neurologically the proper way to those muscles because doing this stuff, that's all well and good if you're adding resistance and external rotation. But these muscles work around a helical axis, right? All our stability muscles outside of our spine work around an axis like this, right? Think of the rotator cuff goes back around and attaches onto the scapula. So it 
It has no business if gravity's coming straight down on it. It has no business exerting force like a bicep or a hamstring or a quad, but it does have a purpose in resisting force. So something as simple as like stand on one leg, do a single leg RDL, do walking lunges, do a kettlebell bottom under press. So with tendonitis issues, it's scaling back resistance a ton, but scaling up that stimulus of instability. Like I can make people sweat doing one round of walking lunges, but it's just their own body weight. I mean, this guy squats, you know, 800 pounds, 900 pounds. It's like, okay, that's a huge discrepancy. See your, you can squat with 900 or with two legs, 900, but you can't stand on one leg with 250 pounds of your own body weight. These injuries happen when your strength outruns your stability. And all we need to do is just get this from here to here. And all of a sudden your, your ceiling increases. With increasing stability, and I know, I know you mentioned like shoulder mobility, for example, like if, if this is all you're able to get out of your mobility, yeah. if you were to able, if you, you know, work on it and you were able to get it here, yeah. do you have to start increasing strength from that new place from kind of like the ground up or how would you suggest going about that? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, your, um, your muscles are a lot more resilient than the inert soft tissue because um, in that process of doing so, like and this is the thing, always be integrating these transient changes in your range of motion into training, right? Too many people like, you know, you put on some guided yoga meditation shit when you're at home before you go to bed. It's like your body only knows a relative increase of range of motion to the nervous system demand of your own body weight, right? Where if you're then going to get the next day, wake up and you're still, your red line of capacity is just your own body weight and you haven't then pushed that envelope further extra physiologically, you're going to get just as tight as you were before. So a lot of what people miss the boat on is actually timing of when they should do these type of drills. Do it before you train. Do it as you integrate into your ascending warm-up sets. Like that's one of the principles that we kind of, we harp on with a lot of our coaches is like make sure that there's like a progression of dynamics. Like if you're going to static stretch, do that first. If you're going to do myofascial release, do that second with like some sort of dynamic component to it. Then put in the stability in that newfound range of motion. Like, I mean, I could sit in a pigeon pose right now and get 20 extra degrees of external rotation through my hip. But then if I just went in and took a nap, it's like, well, if I go squat later, I'm probably going to have to do that all over again. But if I can do that pigeon pose, hold for 20 seconds, maybe like foam roll through, um, some, some dynamic foam roll through my adductors, maybe do like a couple of single leg RDLs, then hop on an empty bar. Because the idea with mobility and, and, and a lot of these prehab type movements is that it's a process of less is more, right? Like we want to go through addition by subtraction. The, the, the CrossFit crowd kind of took this and ran with it because now it's like turned into its own parlor trick. It's like, oh, look at, I'm squatting on a BOSU ball or a med ball balancing a thing on my nose. It's like, that's cool but like frankly it does no increased correspondence to carrying over to my main lifts and helping me stabilize through a lateral plane on my squat or my deadlift then a single leg rdl then a walking lunge um so a lot of people kind of miss the boat on like timing on when they should implement these type of things uh and they just kind of haphazardly go through so to answer your question it's as you're going through your main lifts, you're adapting that perception of the length of the muscle as well, right? Um, so what I would say is when I first prescribe movements like this for people, oftentimes they'll report back and say, I'm not as strong on my main lifts as I was. It's like, exactly, because we're isolating and fatiguing something that's your real rate limiter, right? Like you can give me instability drills and I've been doing this long enough where my, my squat will still be as strong as my squat is because I built that – not really an energy system, but I've built that buffer of stability already. But if you haven't done this before, you're going to allot a good amount of uh, your neurological capacity, let's say, to bringing this up to snuff, and you can't no longer express your strength here. Because guess what? At the end of the day, this stability is the reason that this isn't fucking moving. So yeah, in the first couple of weeks, as you make those transient improvements in stability, as you load those end ranges of motion in kind of new planes, your body's going to be like, ah, uh, I don't know about this. This seems a little strange. But as you reinforce that joint position, you're going to be loading into better length tension relationships of the main muscles itself, right? Like, I mean, I see it so much in powerlifting. Guys like this, they walk up to a bench. It's like, yeah, he's got a single ply fascial suit on under his skin. Yeah, he's going to have a good bench until all of a sudden he doesn't. He's loading into elasticity, not loading into contractility. Like my bicep is strongest here, not fully stretched. 
So if I'm my pecs are fully stretched here, that's no bueno. That's an end game, man. So this is almost like a non-starter. I want it to almost be, I want to pick up that load on my chest where it's at a mid range, where it's like that strong bicep in the center of that range of motion. So that's the idea of progressing through and building, building the strength of the prime movers as you increase the stability, but first increase the mobility. That's kind of a, also you can, you, another big thing you see in powerlifting is the bottom of a squat. I mean, and I've, I've worked with some people and they come to me and at the start, they might have a squat, let's say 225 for a female, which, you know, is fairly good. And you see when they squat, their first video is just a drop in the hole and it bounces out. That's ugly. And you see when they hit that mid range, their quads kick on and then they get the lift. And yeah. I, I always start by telling them like, Hey, like let's drop the weight. Let's actually start by controlling the weight down into that range because you're not supposed to go there. If you just yeah. had them sit there without a bar on their back and told them to squat down into a hole, they couldn't get there without that weight pushing them down. Yeah. And it's increasing that, I guess, that range of motion and learning how to actually get contra or learn how to contract from that stretch position where they have no idea how to actually work to yeah. get out of that squat. Is that kind of the similar? Yeah, I mean, that's a great point. Like, a lot of these injuries are going to happen in that phase between the eccentric and concentric, right? So it's it's as you and this is a problem I see. There's still some multiply lifters kicking around, but when, when guys box squat a lot, they're not teaching that there. I mean, there is going to be a stretch reflex present at any end range of motion of of a movement, and the squat's a great example of this. But if you're, I mean, purposefully alleviating that stretch reflex by using the box, that's all well and good. But when you try and load that, then and you don't have the box as an external buffer of stability, and you then need to load your hips with functional stability in the most structural, unstable position, that's when you start to see issues. So yeah, like I mean, the example you use, the, the girl that's bottoming it out, so she's bottoming out on her structure. She's using the elasticity and that recoil of, of tendons, of ligaments, and that's that might work at a you know, 225, but if that girl's trying to push world record or push a 550 or 600 Wilkes, it's like the, the, it, you'll have to never load a position actively that you can't get into passively right like if, if you can't bring a bar to your chest without a, a, a like 225 on it you don't get to bench right if you don't have that range of motion and that's forcing you that's loading too much into the elastic the elastic property of muscle and not affording you a, a high enough ceiling to build force through that contractility property of muscle when you're like uh, example like you you've the big uh, accessory lifts you've mentioned so far, the single leg RDL and the lunge, and yeah. using that to uh, help with the stability. How do you go about periodizing those, or how do you go about actually training those lifts? Do you, I mean, obviously you wouldn't want someone to just jump right in and start heavy. How would you start making progressions there, and how do you know when to stop, or not stop with those, but how do you know when to start to transition back into doing your compound lift? So I'll use those examples I use are ones that. I keep in throughout. Those are my. Those are part of every warm up I do of all my hip loading. They're almost like, they're almost like gatekeeper drills to me. Like I don't squat unless I can do eight walking lunges, like long stride, really open the hips, come up in a single leg RDL, do a full hinge, heel in parallel with the head, then hip airplane open up, controlling that movement with the hip, close down. Eight reps of those unbroken. My foot hits the floor, we start again. I don't load a bar until I'm from a functional stability standpoint, as stable with my own body weight as I can be. Because then I haven't earned the right to load that extra physiologically. If I can't control myself, how am I supposed to control myself with a barbell on it? Um, so if those lifts I've mentioned are something that I keep in almost as, as like graduation processes of my own training, regardless of whether I'm three weeks out, 20 weeks out, 100 weeks out, those are always there. Because again, stability, as I mentioned, is transient to tap into, but it's also transient to lose, right? I, you know, if I fly out to Florida, right, I'm in Tampa, you better believe it's going to take me a few more, a few more passes to get that eight reps unbroken than it would if I spend a day in my office. So that's my benchmark. That's where I'm going to start. Okay. Now we can start integrating this in with the squat in with ascending warm up sets of the deadlift, any sort of hip dominant movement. I think your question is better suited to like, accessory movements like maybe a safety squat bar squat or a deficit deadlift um it depends on it depends on the purpose in which that accessory movement so here's an example um front squatting 
front squatting is usually an exercise that all progressively overload in conjunction during a meat prep with my main movements. But four weeks out, that main movement gets there that I peak my front squats around four weeks out, sometimes a little earlier because I'm trying to, I'm trying to accrue upper back strength and quad strength. And uh, with the, with the front squat, a good amount of core strength as well that can then carry over when I start to peak for my main lifts. So I'm not, it's not a front squat competition. I can give a shit what my front squat is, but I've seen that when I peak that front squat heavier, every single training cycle, my, my bench goes up my, or my deadlift goes up and my squat go up. So it's like, I found something that has a good dynamic correspondence. Um, so for me, like going into a meet, I'm very selective of, okay, where do I think my strength weaknesses are and knowing that my st- instabilities have more or less been equated for a year round. And then I, I hone in on a few exercises. So, uh, for upper body, uh, I really like deficit deadlifts or sorry for lower body. I really like deficit deadlifts, um, like deficit stiff legs, beltless to try and basically like I, I pull with a fairly rounded thoracic spine, um, almost like a, like a Russian style conventional deadlift where I try and keep the chest up off the floor, but I'm going to try and use that flexion of the spine to gain better leverage from my legs and hips to help accelerate through that midpoint of the lift. Um, so I know that I'm going to end up in a fairly flexed thoracic spine position. So I'm going to train that. I'm going to train that if the, nothing else to, when I go for that max attempt on the platform to at least have some load with a flex spine. So I know I can be able to grind through with some some maximal training through that sticking point and get my spine extended without causing pain. So I really like uh, stiff leg deficits or stiff leg deadlifts from a deficit with purposeful thoracic flexion, safety squat bar. Um, but basically, it comes down to when um, it comes down to what your weak points are from a strength standpoint. Because I mean, the best way to stay injury free is to just be strong as hell, right? Um, as long as like. If the if the muscle is strong enough and the nervous system is strong enough, it doesn't start those adaptations don't make it into the muscle, make it into the ligaments, into the soft tissue. So that's why honestly, that's why some guys you watch them train, some of the top guys, you're like, he's just a freak. Like he's just strong as hell. Like you watch him squat, you watch him deadlift, you're like, how does he even get into his truck after? But it's just he's just so they're so strong that it, that doesn't even begin to enter on their radar. Or kind of insult or affect any any like ranges of motion or any. Hi, bud. <laughs> hey. Guest 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 host. Um, it doesn't affect any uh, any part of their soft tissue at all, just because they're so strong. Um, but for me, I mean, I would never take it all the way all the way into prep. Like I wouldn't peak my front squats along with my back squats because right. there is a certain level of sports specificity that has to be taken into consideration when we're going into a meet. How much, uh, how much accessory work, uh, like with given like a st- uh, the stiff leg deadlifts, like you mentioned, or the safety bar squat or front squats? How much is too much when it comes to that? Obviously, you don't want to peak it along with your normal lift, but you say you know you're tr- you're prepping for a meet and you do your uh, squat, and I assume you do. Do you do front squat on a different day or do you do it together? Yeah, uh, okay. no. So usually squat Monday, front squat Wednesday. Okay, so you're doing it like that. How much work do you do after that? Um, a fair amount because usually, I mean, again, I, I load a front squat for my quads and my mm-hmm. upper back, okay. but primarily my upper back. So my Wednesday front squat, again, it, it changes slightly from meat prep to meat prep based off like the perception of where my weaknesses are. Mm-hmm. Um, so I won't be loading a lot of leg accessory work immediately after, say, my front squat day. I'll use because I'm I'm going to be using less weight. Right. So when I load the heaviest weight on my back squat day, I'm going to overload my accessories there because it's all relative, right? Like if I'm doing, you know, uh, rep work in mid fives or sixes, if I go do walking lunges, like I can put sixty pound dumbbells, seventy pound dumbbells in my hand, and it's like, well, I just had, you know, five six hundred pounds on my back. This is relatively to my nervous system right now. This is nothing, right? So I I kind of lean into that now. There is something to be said about peripheral nervous system fatigue and central nervous system fatigue. A lot of people kind of bastardize it all as one thing. So the as the volume decreases and the intensity uh, increases on my main lifts, then you start to see the accessory work get very pointed. Like I'm not wasting much time after mm-hmm. because last four weeks it's like my volume that Wednesday squat day is no longer front squat because I peaked it. 
but now I'm back in wraps and I'm back under the bar squatting again. So the second I'm done, it's like, basically I'm thinking, how can I prepare myself for the next lift? Not, I'm not going to get stronger in the next four weeks physiologically, but I, I can put myself in a better position to worry about the multiplier that we talked about earlier. What workouts can I do? What exercises can I do to make sure that I can express a hundred percent of what I've been working on in this equation for so long. So my priority with accessory work, as far as like pre and post main lift drills, as I go to meet, it's like, okay, let's try and stay as unbroken as we can. Cause it's really, you're, you, if you're competing at the level that we compete at, it's, it's, you're really flirting with injury every single time you load up, you, just you know, like 90% sure plus, right? Yeah. Like you said, you, you got to make sure you're healthy and you got to make sure you're, like you said, um, when you're doing the heavy squats and reps, your whole goal after that should be recovering till your next squat session. So you can do that again without killing yourself. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, my prep work is like, make sure I'm in good position. So I'm recovering the right systems. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be taxing, you know, I don't want to be folded over my back. Now there's a bunch of discs and, and tissue and cartilage in my back that now has to repair. It's like, I want that to be as loaded as symmetrically and as evenly as possible so that it's only the nervous system. It's only the muscle that has to recover it. Cause that'll make that adaptation. That'll make that recovery. I know that, but if I start, if those start to fail on me and I'm in bad positions because I'm not preparing properly or I'm fatiguing the muscles too much after a session that the muscles are still fatigued to go through that like compound movement for the next session. It's, it's really, that's, that almost becomes the art. And that's where I start believing in some level of subjectivity where it's like, you know, sometimes you got to make hay while the sun shines. Um, but also just because you can, doesn't mean you should, right. Which is a lesson that a lot of powerlifters learn, um, usually pretty quick and usually pretty quick at the hands of an injury. Like, Oh shit, I shouldn't have went for that. Right. You know, and it's idea, you know, we got to save it for the platform, man. Yeah. I mean, if you're, if you want to compete, if you want to be elite, what matters the most is what you do on competition day. Like yeah, like exactly. We talked about earlier just doing something for Instagram. Yeah, it's cool. You get a few thousand views, but end of the day, if you get if you get hurt for it, well, what's the purpose? Yeah, exactly. So, we kind of want to wrap things up here. Uh, a little bit off topic of what we've been talking about, but what you posted on Instagram the other day on your story about the word optimal, mm, could mm, you mm. kind of give me that little breakdown again because that was perfect. That uh, was yeah, perfect. I mean, optimal is just marketing, man. You know what? It's Optimal comes, it's the idea that someone's selling you something mass produced that's ideally and perfect for you. And it's like, people miss the boat. Yeah. I mean, unless you're selling a detailed assessment and education, you're not liberating anyone. You're, 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 it's, it, to me, it's, it's just the buzzword du jour. Like optimal, if from a research standpoint, like optimal usually means average, right? It's a, it's a midpoint, it's a catch-all. So it's actually the opposite of the way it gets, it gets kind of marketed and perpetuated because it's like, Optimal is like very specific. Like you want to optimize your gut health. It's like, oh fuck, give me strength, right? Like there's no metric. There's no. There, it's all subjective. It's all feeling. It's all I feel better. Why? Because some guy on Instagram told you you'd feel better. It, it's just, especially I mean, getting into podcasting. Um, the podcast space in the fitness industry is dominated by a bunch of like middle-aged men who either has been or never were. Right. So it's like you don't know what it's like to kind of be in the throes of competition. You're reflecting back on glory days where it's like, dude, you couldn't hang with what's going on right now. So they'll use this word optimal and health. And, and frankly, the guys that have done it and, and sort of uh, have sort of um, gone through that trial by fire and have actually competed at in high levels. I don't want to hear your advice because their advice is usually like, oh, you know, you want to make sure like you're optimizing your health or you're optimizing. It's like, dude, when, when you were competing, when you were like relevant, when you were strong as hell, were you doing that? No. Then why, if I'm trying to get like that, I don't want to heed the warnings of you because you, all you're preaching now is some level of mediocrity. It's like, I, if, I mean, I have a, uh, there's a saying, uh, Mark Bell popularized it. So I got to give credit where credit's due, but I, I'm pretty sure it's a misquote from uh, an American author where it's like, if you love something, let it kill you. Right. I don't give a shit about what's optimal. I don't gut health. Don't care. It's not going to affect my total for me. It's like, I'll worry about that later. Maybe if I have to, but like, if you're really trying to pursue something, you got to like, you're going to lose sleep over it. You're going to, you're going to, you're going to miss meals here and there. They're not going to be playing the right song on the platform. Like 
get really comfortable with being uncomfortable. And that's going to be at least fortify you mentally if you're going to be a competitor. Because this optimal stuff, it's just, I shut off. The second I hear it, it's just, it's a buzzword. It's salesy yeah. and it's not specific. I think if people really want to pursue something, they need to experience it and not live vicariously through the warnings of those who've experienced in the past. Like, oh, bit of a rant, sorry. It's all good. Uh, I, 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 I mean, being in bodybuilding, you hear it a lot from people and, you know, they, they, they want to train or they want to diet in the most optimal way. And usually if you look at what they're actually doing, they're, they're kind of just pussyfooting around what you should be doing. And it's, okay, well, I did four sets of 12. Well, if you had three more and you, oh, no, I don't want to go to failure. Failure is not optimal according to whatever study I saw. Oh, my well, God. Okay, cool. A study on an average person who was probably untrained. Yeah. Uh, and you're telling me that you're not going to push yourself when you want to do a competition as hard as you possibly can or okay you want to eat some cereal for breakfast because you're scared of having some eating disorder which i know they exist but you know if you're going yeah. to do bodybuilding and you're so prone to having an eating disorder it's probably not the best sport for you to begin with yeah. i mean you know like okay you have to diet you have to drop your calories really low do it don't sit there and claim that oh you're still being you're being optimal by doing this like no, you're, you're, you're kind of just not wanting to work hard and yeah. you, you're not training hard. And I see it so much in powerlifting is the same thing. And like you said, it's just a sales word. People want to sell yeah. you the optimal diet program. I'm going to sell you my macro optimal plan. It's like, okay, well, it's probably not the best thing for you if you're claiming it to be. Yeah. And then, dude, it's even outside of lifting, like literally anything that's, if you're pursuing anything at the highest level, business, any other kind of sport fuck if you want to be the best chess master in the world you're gonna lose sleep you're not gonna be healthy there's right. nothing the only thing healthy about that kind of pursuit is up here yeah. it's it's being driven to the point of like having a purpose and that's the one healthy thing about it and with the way research is going it's like that's probably healthier than like should i eat this or eat that or what's my anabolic window or you know should, i mean i know kids that you know there's there's stuff that we push the envelope in strength and aesthetic sports as far as health in us in a self-inflicting way. We know the damn whereas football, it's like you're still self-selecting to go out on that field and get your head bashed in. Right. So it's still a conscious choice. If the damage is done, regardless of whether I'm doing it to myself with trying to get bigger or trying to get stronger, or you're going out on the field knowing full well that you're gonna go northbound on a southbound freeway and get your bell rung, it's like if everyone's just trying to be the best at the end of the day, and it's no different than academics. Like I couldn't tell you working at Stanford, like, uh, like the drugs these kids will take to test well or to stay up for days on end. But guess what? You're looking at the next president. You're looking at the next CEO. You're looking at the next Forbes 500. So it's like, you want, you got to pay to play, man. And like, if people don't want to play, that's fine. You can sit on the sidelines while the other people who are willing to do what it takes, I do mean, what it takes. Look, look at uh, RG three a few years ago. He tore his ACL. And like three months later, he's back playing professional football. Like you, yeah. you just you just don't do that unless you're willing to be a little bit crazy and go ahead and just push everything you got into. I mean, it's something he's passionate about. He was passionate about playing football. Next yeah. thing you know, he's back out on the field after complete ACL tear. But like when it comes to this type of sport, people always want to make some sort of excuse for it. I feel, and you can't teach it. You can't coach yeah. it, man. It's like you either got the eye of the tiger, or you don't, and you can like. You can lead a horse to water, but, you know, if that dog don't fucking bark, then that's too bad, man. Like, it's – but it's nice when you come across like-minded people who are willing to lay out for it. It's like – and that's the thing with, like, you mentioned the word, like, so passionate. You identify in that. I don't know a damn thing about football. Do you guys do it – you guys have four downs in America, right? Yeah. Yeah, see, I don't even know. Like, we play on, like, a 110-yard field. I think it's kind of like Quidditch. I don't really know. But you tell me that's <laughs> – you tell me that story and I'm in. Like I get that. I resonate on that wavelength laterally from what I'm passionate about to what he's passionate about. And I'm I brought up chess earlier. It's like you could talk to someone who like when they get up in the morning, it's like, yes, chess. I'm like, I fucking like this guy. Yeah. Because I feel the same way. Regardless of what I feel the same way about, that's identifiable. And you can see it behind people's eyes. Like you talk to people who have been in the gym and like, oh, I think I want to do a show. It's like, no, you don't. You yeah. know you don't. Because if you think you kind of want to, it's like you're already subject. You're already putting doubt in there. It's like you're never gonna make it, kid. Sorry. Yeah. 
I mean, shoot, I, I don't, I, I don't consider myself to be a powerlifter, but I've done powerlifting competitions. Yeah, your like, total would argue the other. But, but it's okay. like when, whenever I decided to do a competition, it's not. I'm just. I always say I'm gonna do it for fun. But as soon as yeah. I say that, I'm like, ah, oh, shit, it's all in now. Like yeah. I'm not missing a session. I'm not gonna do anything. It's like, oh yeah, it doesn't mean anything. But to me, it means everything. It's it's a competition. Yeah. I'm there to do the absolute best that I possibly can. If I went in there and just said, oh, let's just see what I can do, screw that. I know what I'm going to do. I, I yeah. knew about it 12 weeks ago when I decided. And you go in and you do it. Yeah, it's just life's, I mean, life's too comfortable now for people. Like, they don't got to worry about getting food. They don't need to worry about safety. They don't need to worry about everything. So, I mean, I talked about this earlier today on our podcast. Like, the hierarchy of needs, this psychological orderance of how, basically how we prioritize living or how we used to, right? So Maslow's hierarchy of needs food existence procreation safety uh family self-esteem legacy the first three are pretty much a guarantee so now we just operate in the self-esteem realm where everyone's just floating around the insta circle and you know they'll do a bikini prep just so they can put up pictures of themselves half naked it's like what's your motivation your motivation is here when you're training when i'm training my motivation is here I literally think of it like life or death because when the weights you start to handle, that's it's survival at that point. Yeah. So I think just too many people start to live higher up the hierarchy and like, again, they're not comfortable with being uncomfortable, which is fine because when the world ends, we'll eat them first. Exactly. Well, thanks for coming on, man. I really yeah, appreciate dude. this conversation. I like that last bit. That was interesting. A <laughs> uh, uh, little, little rant on both ends there. If people yeah. wanted to reach out and find you, what's the best way to go about that? Like, uh, what like, I can tag all your links in the bio below, but do you have a website and things like that? Um, yeah, I mean, if you want to reach out personally, email is jordan at themuscledoc.com, Instagram at the underscore muscle underscore doc. Um, uh, for correctives, we go through www.pre-script.com, so that's like corrective exercise programming, rehabilitation, prehab. Um, Podcast RX Radio, RX apostrophe D Radio, uh, on iTunes and Google Play Store. I think that's it. Okay. I think that's it. I exist. Oh, YouTube, uh, The Muscle Doc. I don't know what my URL is, so okay. search that and you'll find me. But uh, we'll put all the stuff in the description box below as well for everybody. Once again, okay, Jordan, I really appreciate this, man. Uh, you're, it looks like a beautiful day out there. I know it's really sunny here in Florida, too. We got a visit from your German Shepherd and... Once again, thanks for coming on. Yeah, dude, no worries. Thanks for having me. Yeah, all right, dude.